start the recording. Yep, we started it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, everyone, for joining um, in the uh, the conference today. And Calista, did you have any announcements or anything else that you'd like to start off with? No. Um, usually, though, we wait just a few minutes to let people get on. Yeah, no. <laughs> I know. Yeah, we only have 55. To, okay, it's jumping up. I did get a lot of out of office for spring break, so. Go figure. Well, again, welcome everyone. Um, 1.32 according to my clock here. Um, let's get started. If if you're okay, Nicole, you wanna advance it to the next slide. And um, again, please mute your microphone. We've been doing this for what, five years now, it seems like. So again, thank you everyone for joining. Um, just uh, again, looking at the, um, the agenda of today, we've got the, the spring data conference announcement coming up, uh, graduation course credits, uh, review of learning strategies, USIMS updates, uh, announcement about the October 1 deadline for our 2025 school year. We'll be reviewing just, just general information on the CRDC uh, data collection to legislative updates, announcements about the summer EBT for 2024 and 2025, review of school of record, updates on district of residence and validation changes, SSID merges and impacts on students and data, reviewing and resolving validations daily, and announcement about new fields in UTREX, the LIDA screener data. Let's go ahead and advance the next slide. I believe this is for, for you, Nicole. Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, this is just a quick announcement for our spring conference. It's coming up really fast. It is April 24th. It will be from 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. And again, we're going to be at the Nebo School District this year. If you're not able to attend in person, we'd love to have you um, still join us online. We will send out um, a link for that and also an agenda will be coming We'll have similar um, a similar format for the sessions we have this year as well. So please join us and mark your calendars. I guess you just want me to go, Aaron. <laughs> yes, I was just being, uh, jumping in. Uh, uh, yes. We'll just okay. go. Um, go ahead and uh, forward it, Nicole. Um, I'm going to talk about graduation, um, but first I'm going to do a few housekeeping um, notes. Um, information about core codes, educator requirements for teaching a course, and updates to core codes for next year can be found at this link. Please note this is a brand new link um, due to our website changing. So, um, and we do update it frequently, but that's where you can find all the core codes. Um, renewal no notices for all professional educators have are being sent monthly since January, and they have until June 27, 2024 to renew. If you want a list of your educators whose license is expiring, you can email tldata at schools.utah.gov and we'll send you a list of the ones who have uh, who are expiring who have not um, renewed. 
Uh, LEA specific licenses for new educators hired for next year, you cannot request them till after we roll over and their assignment is in Cactus. Um, the last thing is Cactus, June 30th is Sunday and I can't get the team to work that day. So all Cactus updates need to be in by June 28th at noon for rollover. Um, and the last thing I didn't put on the thing, if you have any schools that are closing or opening next year, um, please let me know as soon as possible so that we can have that updated for the rollover. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've had a lot of questions about the courses that meet graduation credits. And there is a link and it has actually the list of the uh, current requirements, courses that meet graduation requirements. So you'll notice there's foundation and applied. Each area has their own distinction about which courses are required and which ones are applied. And that can be found on this, um, at this link. Um, and please note these change yearly. Um, or they can change early, so just stay aware aware of them. Next slide, please. They can also be found on that core code list on the web. So if you look over on, it says core flag, and that means the course has core requirements and it meets the courses um, the, the course the course requirements. If you look over on the graduation credit, it has language arts, math, or science. So language arts, like eight, journalism, can, will count for that fourth year the of uh, language arts, um, and but it does not count for the core one, two, three. But AP language, English literature also applies for language arts for the fourth year, or it can apply for the core. So these are in both places, um, and. Um, they're available and we, please send these out to your registers and counselors. We've had a lot of problems with cork cords with graduation credit lately. Next slide. Um, so here's another example. So like sculpture one, two and three will count for the art credit, but calligraphy and sign making will not count for art, but does you could use it towards an elective credit. And this is all in the core codes. And um, but if you could share this with your registers, that would be wonderful. And counselors. Next slide. So then there's courses that don't count towards the 24 state required credits. Core codes starting with 25-01 cannot be counted for any credit. This is like release time um, or student aid. Um, uh, and placeholders for like students who are attending a ho at a hospital that the district or LA charter school is still responsible for the educational costs. C core code starting with 2502 can count towards the district graduation credits, but they cannot count for the required 24. This is student study skills um, and a bunch of, there's a bunch of other courses, but these cannot count towards the state 24 credits. Um, no, there is not a cheat sheet on it uh, with the columns stand for, but I will make one and add it as a second tab on the core code um, thing on the web. Is there any other questions? All right, next slide. Um, Christian, maybe... there is no question in the chat. Oh, okay. I didn't see it. Can you, let me check. Um, there is not a help sheet, I, Stacy, um, but I will add one to the uh, core code sheet on the web. Um, so learning strategies. Next slide. We've gotten some questions about this, um, and it's a course that supports core academic study, and it may include assessment and oral language development. So this is like ACT test prep, Arise, Utah Aspire, or it could be additional time for core courses that students need additional support in. It doesn't include like a, an LEA course. We've had LEAs using it for 
homeroom slash or an advisory where you know students go for 15 minutes before going to the regular courses it that this is that is not an appropriate use of it it is not should not be used for as a soep holding place there are soep courses that meet this and this is not a the character education course that is a district only credit and it doesn't count towards the 24 credits does anybody have any more questions about this course All right, I'm done. I guess that means it's my turn. My apologies, I have a cold, so my voice is a little scratchy. Um, Katrina Brinkley, Chief Product Owner and Program Manager for USIMS, um, which is the Utah Schools Information Management System. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. I'm just gonna give a really quick overview of what each of our domains is in case you're unaware. Uh, USIMS has been divided into three domains. And those domains are the educator, the student, and the finance domain. Uh, our educator domain deals with all educator licensure um, and personal information, background checks, all of that stuff. So right now, uh, the team has completed the educator personal information and educator licensing. They are currently working on the background check and fingerprint process, and the university recommends professional license or educator prep program. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, they are just finalizing those university recommends. That's actually in beta test with some users right now, alpha maybe. <laughs> um, and they're working on finalizing some background check processes with BCI. Um, so that will allow your educators to get their process done online and get their uh, rep back in their um, background information uh, much quicker. So that's the goal for the for the educator team. I'm going to pause there and see if there are any questions about what the educator domain is doing or working on. I don't see any in the chat. I don't see any hands up. Okay, next slide, please. So our student data domain um, is one of our larger domains, obviously, and I'm sure all of you are well aware of all of the data that goes in for students. Uh, this is their definition of done, what they're targeting for the 1st of July of 2024. Right now they're working on an EdFi API um, to start integrating and getting information passed between your SIS and USIMS. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, they're working on the enrollment exchange for student identity, school and enrollment history, and student record data access, which as I mentioned, an API that will allow data transfer between the SISs and USIMS, allowing USIMS to get information from one SIS and send it to another. Um, they're also working on basic access to the student backpack, the student learner profile, student, to student demographics, attendance, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Um, they're working currently, they just finished up with the statewide assessment results for Acadiance reading um, and course grades and history for concurrent courses. They're working on a uh, student data movement between the LEAs, uh, as including assessment growth scores and uh, that statewide enrollment exchange. Um, any questions on this one? Oh, you went fast. You read my mind. Thank you. Okay. Uh, finance, uh, working on an API. We've actually gotten uh, a majority of our financial institutions working, uh, not institutions, systems providers, um, working with our API. They're already uh, logging in and starting to develop toward the API. Um, so we're seeing quite a few of those start testing things out. Um, if you are uh, looking for more information on that API, my product owner, Don Moody, um, is leading up this and he's been reaching out to most of the LEAs about what financial system they're using for their, uh, for their submissions and working on getting something integrated if we possibly can. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Coming up, the finance domain is working on indirect cost functionality and the calculations for it. Um, they've also are working on getting some of their previous uh, development um, into production and finalizing some of that viewing so that you can see the account codes and things like that within USIMS. Um, and that should be coming within the next couple of weeks. 
any questions? I went through USIMS really fast. So um, most of this is for your records, for your information. If you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out. We are still looking for people to join us in our focus working groups. We're also having a functional advisory board meeting, which will give a more in-depth overview of all of these things um, in, on April 9th at 4 p.m. Uh, if you don't have an invite to that, I'm happy to get it for you. We do record that and then send out notes and the um, PowerPoint after that meeting as well. All right, thank you very much. Okay, I've got the fun ones. Okay, um, October 1 deadlines for the 2024-2025 school year. Go ahead and advance to the next slide. We will be going over this a uh, lot, uh, uh, not in more detail. Here's the more detail, but HB3, um, which is a very long one. And if you need to find reference to where this is at in the law, the easiest way to find it is to go to the website type in October and you'll find this, but this is item 331. It's basically to the state uh, board of education um, operations. The legislature intends that the state board of education in conjunction with the governor's office of planning and budget and the legislative fiscal analyst develop a procedure to provide all data needs to calculate the budget adjustments for student enrollment growth and weighted pupil unit value adjustments outlined in this law to the governor's office and the legislature before October 15th of each year. <laughs> I'm just smiling. I hope some of you are smacking your, uh, your palm on your forehead going, what? Well, it's now in, in law. We have to submit two. But basically, this is called the CDC. Uh, we have to have our data available to them on, it says uh, before, but we're it's, we're looking at October uh, 15th. We've met with um, um, our operation teams, with our database teams, um, with my team and such. So go to the next slide, if you don't mind. What we are proposing, this will go to the school board uh, next week um, in the finance committee is we'll be Recommendation is update for, this is board rule R277-484, and it's referenced, but that the Utrex um, October 1 data be submitted on the first Wednesday in October, meaning this year that would be October 2nd. What happens is, is the they will review this information in finance committee and then um, in the May board meeting, uh, this will be reviewed and um, adopted or passed by the full board. So what does this mean? <laughs> it, it means our data submission process has got to be tightened up and, and, and sped up. So instead of having till the 7th uh, for data submissions with a possibility of an extension, uh, this would be adjusted to, again, that first Wednesday in October. Um, I don't know what this means if it's October 1 yet. We have not had that discussion. I haven't looked um, that far forward in the calendar to see when October 1 falls on that first Wednesday. Um, but a couple of things that this would mean. So one, <laughs> ex exactly, how does this happen? What happens? Um, we know that we have students moving in on October 1, and we have those uh, LEAs doing those updates. Um, two, this would be that there would be no extensions in um, October for this data submission process. There are some additional problems that we need to work out. Um, I'll be working out actually with you guys, um, discussing this in our April meeting. But um, so what does that mean if there's no extensions and and um, something catastrophic happens? We don't have those answers right now, but just know that this is the proposal for moving forward. Are there any questions, screaming emojis, people want to comment? I hope you're paying attention to what I'm saying here.
maybe you're all happy. You're like, yay, <laughs> I see a sigh. Um, yes. Uh, and then yikes, we're seeing this in the comments. So again, that will be October 2nd. We do the submission. We discuss this within the, the Utrecht submission timeline. Uh, then we meet with, with uh, Cliff and his team. What does this mean? Again, we'll have more information available. Um, thank you now, people, for finally uh, <laughs> giving some reaction. Uh, and it helps me know that you are paying attention. Uh, this is uh, alarming. Again, this is now inside of this is state law saying we have to get this information submitted by this time. So thank you for your response. We're all just in shock. I agree. Uh, there's some complex issues that we'll have to work out on this. Um, another question, who consulted with them on the deadline? Won't work. Um, that's from M Emily. When you say who's them, uh, them being the legislature is, they don't consult with, I mean, they consult with us, um, but ultimately they said no. Uh, we need to make this in, come in faster. There's a lot of budgetary moving parts on the legislation um, and with the governor's office where they say we've got to hit th that mark uh, for their deadlines. Uh, and then the question is, might the collection window be open a little bit earlier? That jumped um, for data checks, just not serv uh, certification on October 1. The answer is yes. We, we talked about that. Cliff, your hands up. Do you want to answer? or add? Yeah, I can uh, add to it and also, you know, agree that uh, it is certainly concerning for us as well, too, from the processing side, uh, and we're keeping your processing areas in mind. Um, we expect that the first and the second are going to be um, crazy demand on our servers, uh, as, again, with new students coming in on the first, that really gives you those two days, the first and the second, to be able to go through and finish what's needed to be in place. So even if we do give the window earlier, it doesn't mean that you won't have to return to it and still come back in on the first and the second to make sure that you get those um, last minute students into the system. So it is a very tight, tight time frame. Um, and, you know, with this, uh, the last area of my conversation uh, later in the meeting is going to be kind of going over just reiterating how tight this is and how we want to try to resolve as much as possible before we get to that last day or two to focus on what's actually just coming in. Um, I hope that everybody can actually go along with that because I feel that's what's going to be needed. Uh, that's my two cents. Thank you. Um, and again, the comments are, are coming in now. Uh, uh, people are saying, hey, can we move it? But the answer is no. <laughs> I, um, we've got, again, it's a legislative law as we're looking at this and then just the whole processing time and guaranteed to get it to them. We plan on discussion next month at our April conference. Um, amongst, again, ourselves, our concerns, um, when I say our concerns, I mean, this is everyone's concern as we look at this saying, okay, legislative law, uh, okay, how are we going to get this? How can we achieve this? Where are our weaknesses? What happens when things go catastrophically wrong? Um, how do we deal with that? Um, and we'll come back. So again, flexibility on that date when you say, why Wednesday? Why can't we do it you know, on the 7th? So I mean, I'm just reading through the comments is there are some complications behind all of this um, as we looked at, again, internally at our process and looked at the legislative requirement because um, it's not just you have to submit the data and then we're done. The data have to be submitted. It has to go through an ETL. It has to uh, go through an audit. It has to go through a validation. It has to go through the uh, MSP process, um, and then it ha you know which kicks it out for the you know the official counts that then have to go up to the legislature. Um, 
we could typically get them the data by the 20th. A lot of times we're getting it to them by the 22nd, 23rd. Um, but anyway, so I'm just sharing with you that I'm the bearer of the bad news today. Um, we just plan on one, having that discussion, make sure that you have a conversation with, uh, uh, with your LEAs. Um, this is going to be talking with the registers, obviously be talking with your superintendents, uh, with your directors, uh, with your principals, just saying, Hey, <laughs> uh, legislation is, is demanding a tighter turnaround, um, we're going to have to figure out how to deal with it in our current uh, system. So um, in, when USIMS comes online and things become much quicker in interoperability, maybe this will not be as big as a, an issue. Again, obviously, there's no promises there, but just be aware that this is coming and some realities that we have to deal with. So there's the first fun one. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, and go to the next slide on this one. So CRDC, it was due last week. Yay. <laughs> You're like, that was, that was crazy. I understand uh, the state was not able to uh, pre-populate for anyone. Um, I apologize behind that. What happened sharing with, with uh, all of you is the federal government in their, their modernization efforts changed their systems with with all the states last year, we went from um, the old system to a new system they call EdPass. They changed their deadlines um, on us. And um, it, well, it, it about killed us. Um, and, and Utah was not the only one uh, across the state. We were dealing with uh, just with changes and things not working on the federal level as we submit information up to what's called EdPass. Um, and through all that process, we did not have the capacity or the bandwidth at all to be able to pre-populate over through that process over to the, the civil rights data collection. Um, as we move forward, the hope is then we will be able to get systems up running automated, they work better, uh, but again, just kind of sharing with the group is the way the federal government has changed it. It really hampered us as a state to be able to pre-populate any data into the in the CRDC collection. But we were not the only state that had this issue. So sharing the pain with everyone else, um, it was, you know, it was something that we were we were hoping that we could do way back in uh, December, and it just was not possible. So. Um, Okay, let's go to the next slide. Let's legislative update. So here's some more fun news. Um, I was meeting with Lise the other day um, and she's like, this group is wonderful because we don't have to do all of the bills. We got to really pare this one down. So, but it still has impact on everyone. So Elise, thanks for joining us. I will stay, my mic will stay active as well, but I'm gonna let Elise, I'm gonna let you Come off you know, mute, guide hey, it. Man, be kind of... Oh, ahead. real quick before you move on, there was a question about CRDC in the chat. I didn't see it. What was it? Um, is there a way to make a Utrecht export align closer to the needed data for the CRDC report? Um, that's part. That's a great question. Part of the modernization effort that we are doing inside of USIMS will address this. Um, so yes, ish. Uh, there's a, lots of moving parts inside of here. Um, it we're working our way towards that. So whatever that, that future state of the exchange as we get inside of there, there's also some automated processes that we anticipate will be in place. Uh, sharing with the group really what it is, is a, it's making sure our systems align um, in an automated process into the federal one. So you don't have to do anything on your side. It just 
submits correctly. So we we can have a deeper discussion about that later. Um, in fact, if we want to mark that as a, a conversation in April, happy to do that. Thank you, Doug, for bringing that up. Anything else I missed in the chat or? Um, just a comment as you think about the April discussion. Um, Ellie is just wanting to compromise on that date if possible. <laughs> uh, and again, we totally understand um, what you're saying. So again, just know that it will go to the board next week and the finance committee for discussion. We'll have our group discussion in April, and then I will take feedback from that um, as it goes to the full board. So we will, we will, you know, more to come. Okay, Elise, let's take it away. Um, go ahead and advance to the next slide. Thanks for setting me up with such like excited <laughs> <laughs> feelings. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here. My name is Elise Nui, and I'm the um, policy advisor at the Utah State Board of Education. So we have um, lots of slides. We've pared them down to just the ones that really impact data at the LEA level. However, if you have any questions about anything, please shout out, put it into the chat. I would love to answer questions um, and, and help you out that way. But we go to the next slide. Just as an overview, um, this last legislative session, there were 273 bills related to education that were introduced. And of those, 166 passed. So this is a much higher bill passage rate than we've seen in the past. So we're dealing with a lot more legislation just generally um, than we have in the past. So it's a heavy lift for us at the agency, but also for you all at the LEA level. So um, thank you all for your hard work. Um, there will be a bill book. We've just put the finishing touches on the text. It should come out um, next week, about a week from today. So those will be coming out to LEAs that will have a little bit more detailed information about the LEA requirements for each bill. So be on the look for that. Um, and that'll include all of these bills as well as many others. So, all right. Um, just as a quick, quick, um, the WPU went up um, to 5% or increased by 5%. However, um, it wasn't a straight increase. A lot of the funding that was added to the WPU and to programs came from other programs that were dissolved. So we'll talk a little bit about that in each of the individual programs, but um, so there was an increase overall, um, but maybe not quite as exciting as this looks. So just a little asterisk on that one. Next slide. Overall, there was the $803 million in new funding. Um, we are working on 62 rules. Um, that's a huge amount comparatively from years in the past. So updating our rules and our policies to match the new legislation. I'm sure that looks similar in LEA level as well. There are 10 new programs and then six reports that are new to LEAs to um, turn in. So just keep that on your radar. And next slide. One of the big ones um, that was funded was the student safety bills this year. Um, there were several different ones that impacted student safety, but the one that's probably most interesting for you all is the early warning systems. So in the past, we've had, I think, something like 16, Aaron, is that right? Schools Six, participating. Not schools. So it's about 16 LEAs. LAs. We have 300 and... I want to say 55 schools are actually participating in the state early warning system, uh, the legislation just for the group. And we'll be going over this a little, little bit more detail. Uh, now says all shall participate. We know what the cost is for all, and it is more than $2 million. So anyway. Yeah, and that's kind of a common theme is a lot of things that we're being asked to do, but we're not necessarily funded. And so... Um, at least, you know, in talking with Wilcox, there was, who was the the representative who passed the school safety bill, there was kind of an understanding that it may take us a little bit as a state to catch up to where he wants 
us to be by the legislation. So there is a little bit of wiggle room, but as far as the bill itself goes, um, it does state that all schools should have an early warning system up to the standards as described in the bill. Um, and 2.1 million was appropriated for that, but like Aaron Breff said, not enough for what we actually need. Um, I think, oh, next slide. I can't hit the slides. And this is just for your um, knowledge and information. There was also an innovation in AI grant pilot program. So that was, it's running through, I believe the governor's office through GOEO. Um, is that correct, Aaron? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. So <laughs> It makes me nervous pause. having you here as the expert. <laughs> um, pause right there. Um, if you guys are running any AI development or you're aware of any, make sure you communicate with your uh, your leadership to say there, it, there are some grant opportunities. Um, again, it's in the bill book. So thank you. Yeah. And then the other one was the K-12 Computer Science Initiative. Um, and that just appropriated some funds for that ongoing program. Next slide. So as we dig into some of the bills that will impact data um, at the LEA level, one of the first big ones is the student survey amendments. And this was run by Representative Liz and B. Um, and one of the big impacts that this has is it allows LEAs to opt out of the climate survey. Um, and so now, whereas LEAs all had the same climate survey and then individual students could opt out of taking it, entire LEAs can now opt out. So you'll need to check with your LEA to see what the status is um, for your particular school or situation. Um, in addition, it requires an LEA to get updated policies um, so that there is parental consent given for all surveys at the beginning of the year. And the expectation is that this would happen at registration. Um, one thing to note though, is that if you have a student move from another LEA, even though that student had probably parental consent at their former LEA, it, the new LEA needs to get new parental consent. So you can't transfer it across LEAs. However, what I don't know is if you can transfer it within an LEA, so from school to school, if a student moves within a district. Um, but and, and I'll, I'll I'll give you my policy opinion on that one. Is I love that, that should be because the LEA usually houses all that information. That should be from a school to school. Should be fine because we assume that um, upon registration, you've received that information, and if a school a, a student does transfer that would be something easy to continue to pass on to the new school. Again, we're going off of assumptions that you have it. So we want to make sure that uh, that is a correct assumption. But sharing that with the group, if you have any comments, feedbacks, uh, we're interested in, to hear that. But just reiterating again, from LEA to LEA, nope. Um, so this is not going to be um, collected in Utrex. It's not going to be in the USIM system. We are not getting this information and passing it um, and putting it in any form of automation on our side. Uh, when's the implementation of this required, Elise? I believe it's July 1st. So how many, how many have completed their next year's uh, registration process already? Like all of you? <laughs> so that's an interesting question. Uh, make sure you have a discussion with your your uh, with yeah with your leadership of how fast are you supposed to get this in place? What is the uh, expectations? Um, so reading notes, most districts do a district res uh, registration and not individual schools. So I would think it would be okay. So again, thank you for following up on the assumption within the LEA itself, that umbrella should be fine. Um, anyway, and then Robert said, Bill says something like at registration, but that is usually the year before, can USB spin this to be at the start of a new year or, or some such? Yeah, we're not getting it. <laughs> I'm just letting you know, this is the LEA process. You do need to collect that information because when a survey goes out, let me give you an example. Early warning system, the current vendor that we have, they actually have the availability within their own system to collect this inf that information. It's an opt-in um, 
that they can get that. Uh, so that that would work, but you would have to maintain that so you um, don't violate that throughout the year. So a teacher wouldn't be sending out a teacher accounts or whoever wouldn't be putting out a survey information from the students when uh, law says uh, it's an opt in now. So. When you say spin, yes, we're we're discussing it is the new year. We're not saying it has to be registration because that's kind of forward thinking, saying that makes the most sense. However, um, something for you guys to you know make sure you're taking notes and and you're discussing with your LEAs of how you want to do that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. That was very helpful and I took down some notes as we we're putting together our rules at the the agency level these are all helpful things for us to think about so I really appreciate your comments um other things just to note about this this particular bill is that students cannot be punished or rewarded for participating or choosing not to participate in a survey um LEAs should be prepared to give parents copies of the survey so they should be able to see the exact questions that are being asked and so I but again, that's going to be an LEA decision on how that actually looks, as long as parents can see the individual questions that are being asked. Um, and again, the USB does not, or sorry, LEAs do not have to administer the USBE model school climate survey, um, but can opt out as an entire LEA. So, all right. Another big one for everyone, including those of you in data, is the school safety amendments from Representative Wilcox. So this was HB 84. Um, and this was full of all kinds of stuff, but we'll hit on just a few of the big ticket items within that. Um, the first is that each school needs to complete a safety needs assessment, um, and each LEA will have need to have designated a school safety and security director. So that person will be kind of the liaison between the state and the LEA um, to get a lot of these um, items done over the next few years. Um, there's also the school guardian program you've probably heard a little bit about as well as panic buttons for teachers that they can wear and have um, alert the main office. And the next slide should talk about, yeah. Um, a couple Elise, other things. I have yeah. a question. Um, on the previous slide, uh, am I correct that the school safety and security director is not the school safety and security specialist? That is a great question. So, because I know that's I'm, going through a name change as well. So, I just wanted to make sure because it can be really easy to confuse. Within this the scope of this meeting, I'm going to say, and this is to uh, to Willie, um, I'm going to wait until that gets written out <laughs> because they're, they're just sharing also with the entire group. This this bill is nine hundred. No, it's not it, fifty seven it pages. I think it, it was. It's longer than fifty seven. It's like sorry, it's only about a hundred pages long, but it's a hundred pages of legalese, and you know this. This department and this section, you do it. And there is a lot behind us, so there are some moving parts. Just be aware. <laughs> so, and when we say moving parts, trying to figure out, you know, because a lot of the uh, um, powers are given over to the the state the state safety chief. What's his chief? I think it's his name title. Anyway, uh, it's kind of like um, a fire marshal. He, they have quite a bit of authority, um, and so we will be adjusting accordingly. Anyway, I'll be quiet. No, that was great. And Robert Warren in the comments made a great point that there's a distinction for schools 350s um, and over. So that was one of the things that got negotiated throughout the session was that there needs to be different accommodations or different expectations for some of our rural schools or our small schools or our charter schools about some of the expectations. Um, so it really, a lot of things are going to have to be worked out over this next year. Um, a lot of policies are required to be updated um, at the LEA level. So your SROs, the school guardian. Um, but the one that probably affects you the most is the early warning system. So um, it does not require a certain kind of early warning system. Um, however, that is difficult, right? We're, we're going to have to navigate, I think, as a state, a lot of questions about um, how 
to put this all together, what the early warning system looks like at an LEA level and how data gathered data is gathered um, throughout the state. Because one of the other things that Wilcox wanted and that is in the bill is a public dashboard with school incident data. So um, he got this idea from Florida. Florida has, has been working on this the last couple of years to um, put out a dashboard where anyone can get on to the the state's website and be able to see what kinds of safety incidents are occurring at the school and the LEA level throughout the state. Um, and so that's the end goal that he has that probably won't be rolled out, even though it's required in the bill. We've been very and transparent. That probably won't be rolled out for quite some time, a few years, but that is kind of where this end goal is looking. Yeah. Aaron, what else do you have to add? So yeah, just, yes, a couple things. Um, early warning system, um, we will be uh, requesting, I don't think it's in our slides today, but we will be requesting from each LEA. Uh, just, uh, we're going to do an update into the CACTUS system saying, are you going to use the state or are you going to use your own? Um, part of the requirement inside of there of using your own is um, there are certain standards or requirements that your early warning system will need to do. Um, and so we'll, again, conversations and things will be coming along with that. Obviously, we don't know who our vendor is going to be for this because we have to do an RFP for this, uh, for this process. Um, but with that said, uh, be warned that uh, connecting into an early warning system through an outside vendor does take, I mean, you guys are aware of this, it takes some, uh, some techn technical know-how to make sure that the data are uh, going over to said system um, typically we uh, do a nightly load um, in our current our current um, vendor. So things are coming. Um, and this is just for your information. Again, talking about that dashboard, it will be more than just the school incident that comes through the student record. We're also going to be collecting information from uh, the uh, Utah um, other police databases and such where we'll be commingling or bringing the data together and making sure that A, it is not a violation of privacy, but it has a, a transparent view of what's going on uh, within the community. So, and by the way, there's no funding for, for uh, personnel to do this. And that's another fun thing that we're trying to figure out. So just sharing. Yep. Okay. Lots of problem solving. <laughs> it's exciting. The one last thing, um, and I don't know if this um, falls into what you all do, um, but the bill also requires that the SRO or a designee within the local um, police department is given access to student data in compliance with FERPA. So there's the ability that they can be considered a school official for the purpose of FERPA. Um, so that's when you're going to have to work out uh, as well with your LEAs. Yeah, that that that's kind of an important one. I don't know if this group is directly involved with that, but uh, the IT side should not be saying, nope, 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 you have to make certain agreements or whatever it is. Again, this is your leadership who will be uh, who's recognizing, yep, we are designating them and they'll have access. So, yep. Yeah. <laughs> and I like Robert's a comment. Good luck uh, regarding her, but yeah, amen. It's not, it's not easy to figure these things out. So, okay. Nope. Um, the next really big one was HB 362 from Representative Lizenby and Senator Colomore was the juvenile justice revisions. Um, I don't, um, the habitual truant was a big one. I don't know if any of you remember about seven years ago was a big juvenile justice reform here in Utah. And one of the big conversations was about not allowing um, students who are truant to end up in the juvenile justice system for that truancy, right? That we had an over, there were too many kids who were ending up in the juvenile justice system solely because of truancy. And so that was, that was moved out, but by accident, it was completely taken out of the juvenile justice code. Um, and so there was no way that a student with truancy could be sent to the juvenile justice courts. Um, so that was re- introduced into the bill. So the definition of habitual truant is back in there and schools and LEAs can now refer a student um, 
who is found to be habitually truant, but only if they are found to be habitually truant twice in one year and there have been um, enough evidence-based interventions provided to the student. So I don't know if this applies to any of you or um, your work, but that was a big one um, that affects LEAs. Um, and the others is the reintegration plan. So this is one that several different bills actually touched on the reintegration plan. So that was part also of that juvenile justice reform. Um, a few years ago, the idea that when a student gets taken out of their school setting, um, typically to be within the juvenile justice system, and they are put back, there was very little communication that was happening between the two agencies about what that student needs, about what that student has done, about things to be aware of. And so these reintegration plans are there um, to bring different stakeholders having to do with this, this student um, into conversation about what the student needs and what the best placement is. And so right now, many of these reintegration plans are on paper and are just files from what I understand. Um, but I'm gonna pass it over to Aaron. I believe that there is an intent that those are gonna go online. There's Maybe. some no. stuff, yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, another big one was HB 82 with Representative Perucci, and this was really just kind of an omnibus education bill that had all kinds of details in it. The ones that I think are important for you all to know, um, it's actually on the next slide. Are there any of these? Okay. Um, and this one was from Representative Perucci, was very insistent that the legislature and the USBE as an agency should have access to email addresses for all um, employees of the public education system. And so starting October 1st of this year, um, LAs are required to provide work email addresses to the agency, and then that will need to be updated on an annual basis. Okay, so now this is interactive time. Yay! Take out your phones or whatever it is. I didn't give, there's not, I didn't provide a link. So there's a QR code. Over the next minute, it only should take you a minute. Please take a picture of that QR code. Answer the survey because we have assumptions and we're testing our assumptions uh, to make sure that they are correct because we do need to figure out how do we get um, this list of emails. Um, and if we're talking to the right people or if we think we know who be talking to anyway so i'll be quiet um please that please again take the survey no oh, when's putting uh the link in the uh chat if you don't have a phone thanks Wayne. thank you when Question is, is that a full-time only or part-time employees as, as well? It's everyone. This is from the bus driver it's all the way to the superintendent. Everyone gets paid. Um, or I believe just maybe uh, volunteers, at least. Do we know? I do believe it says employees. Just employees. So everyone gets paid. I will check and see right now, though. Yeah, school employee work email addresses. So specific to the work emails, not personal, but just employees. Okay. 
So Wynn's telling me 56 have responded so far. Awesome. Thank you. We have 97 participants. We're about halfway done. I'm guessing. That's a see the latest huh? comment. That's a great comment. <laughs> What's that? That the slide wording is work email, and that is also the bill wording. Um, but what if they don't provide work emails to part-time employees? That's a great question. And I don't we haven't thought about that. <laughs> it's like, why why not? <laughs> Writing this down. Is that one of the questions on the survey? No. Oh, well. <laughs> the survey is real quick, like is in. We assume we can get this out of your HR system. What LEA are you and who? And there's just a you know a multiple select. Who who should we be contacting uh, to get this information? So uh, we don't substitute. provide work emails for substitute teachers, and I yeah I understand that. I I don't will say right now I don't think substitute teachers is going to fall into this because they're really like part time. You know, unless they're a permanent or long term substitute, which then is the full time, right? Or it's time limited full time. Yeah. Interesting stuff to think through, though. So I'm yeah. grateful for these comments. This is really helpful. When were we at? Count wise. I think we're ready to move forward, but I just want to make sure. Just coming in at about 60 responses. Okay. Um, again, the link is in the chat. Okay. Um, and then there's that comment here that says, hey, when we contract this contract services, makes sense. We'll make note, we'll make sure that, that that's fine. Um, okay, let's move to the next slide. Thank you everyone for your response. Um, a couple of these, we just wanted to point out HB3, the appropriations adjustments. So that's the really big bill that includes where all the different money is going. But this is the bill that outlined that the October 1st data um, is due on or before the first Wednesday of October. So, well, the 15th. So, okay. yeah, that, that's where it's at. If you're like, but why go read that bill? <laughs> it's, it's, it's just little, <laughs> little but consequential. Yeah. Okay, hey, thank you. All right, and then um, another one. So this is another one having to do with those reintegration plans. Um, and so I'll give you just a tiny bit of background so you understand where this one came from. Um, there was a student who um, had a reintegration plan, but then switched LEAs. And in switching LEAs, there was something, uh, some violent offense happened at the second LEA um, that there was a conversation about whether or not the school should have been warned, right? That they should have known that there was a past behaviors. And so um, 246 was run by Senator Escamilla um, that just says, says that those reintegration plans and those notices that you receive as an LEA from the juvenile justice system need to be saved for at least a year. And this allows for um, other LEAs or anyone else that student leaves for you to have that information to pass on to them. Um, we've uh, asked, for, a, yeah. So I'm just going to say, let's, let's add a little bit more context to this. So highly sensitive information, highly uh, secure, whatever you want to call it. This is not for general teacher access. This is right to know by the principal and whoever the principal deems necessary to see this information. Again, it needs to have um, a retention policy or you know, uh, clean up after one year or when adjudication has been completed um, on this information. The important thing to note is as we move forward, in particular inside of USIMS, this data will be transferable within the USIMS systems. We were able to make sure that implementation um, is not until the uh, July of 2025. So make sure you have conversations with your SIS 
systems, you might already have a place to put notes like this inside of there where they're highly sensitive um, that you can put it in there and you put basically once it's received, set a timer on it. Because after a year, if nothing happens, it uh, needs to be uh, deleted out. But it's got to be able to transfer from one year to another year. If the the because you know when these things happen, um, it it's not going to set up perfectly with uh, our school year alignment. So, yeah. Oh, any questions? Do we have all things figured out in this perfectly? No, but this definitely is an SIS to uh, SIS uh, transfer that has to be has to take place. And if I had to Again, guess, I would think there's going to be more bills like this coming as the yeah. years go on, because there's there is a lot of conversations about how we can better communicate across agencies, so DCFS and JJS and the school systems, as well as across school systems about students, but on, again, highly, highly sensitive material, right? And so how to both respect students' rights and FERPA, but also get the needed information out. So yeah. my guess is- and, and I, Yeah, and I was gonna say, I can share with this group too, is uh, the Utah uh, Data Research Center, which is called our, um, it's that basically it's P20W system. So, Basically, it's preschool all the way up through workforce services and such. Um, we have a grant for the next four years looking at what we're calling bridge, which would exchange data between different um, agencies in such a manner. So um, we were working on some solutions for this in anticipation. Uh, so anyway, I'm just sharing that with you guys. Thank you. Uh, the next two are also kind of important. So SB 177, um, absenteeism prevention amendments. This allows a teacher to take um, attendance as part of a grade if a student's parents um, allow for it. So I'm not sure how often you're going to see this in your LEAs, um, but if a student's parent wants that child's um, attendance to be part of their overall grade in the class, they can set that up with their teachers. And from what I understand, this is a teacher level conversation. Is that correct? That was, I, I thought it was an LEA policy first. If, yes. if LEA allows it. So again, this is going to be your an SIS option or um, component. If the LEA allows it, then, then it'd be a teacher discussion saying, yes, we can put that inside of there. So Again, thinking about, you know, should attendance be a part of the grade system? Maybe it already exists within your SIS, and this is no big deal. If it doesn't exist inside of there and your LEA um, goes with that decision that they're going to allow this, then your SIS will have to be updated to allow for this. So there. A lot to think about. Um, thank you. HB 499 is Education Reporting Amendment. So this was this bill came out of um, quite a few years of conversation between the legislature and LEAs about um, how often reports are due for LEAs to both the state um, USBE as well as the legislature, um, as well as training requirements and all kinds of things that that are um, creating a burden for LEAs. And so the conversation was, where can we trim some of this off? Um, and this bill, um, amends the frequency of certain trainings at the LEA level to allow the state board to establish a three-year trainings um, cycle. So rather than some trainings having to happen every year, they can now happen on a three-year cycle. Um, it's going to be, yeah, there's going to be a lot of moving parts figured out at the state level to figure out um, exactly how that's going to look, as well as at your LEA, how that's going to roll out for your LEA as well. But just putting that on your radar. Erin, was there anything else on that one? Just letting you guys know, I don't know who will be responsible, but obviously if you're going to a three-year cycle, somehow you're going to have to figure out how to track this. Meaning, yay, do we do it all, all and done? Or is it, you know, ones, I, we don't have the answers for that. And then comment was in there, but they added six new reports. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's besides the point. That's besides the point. <laughs> Yes. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> so, 
All right. The next three have to do more with student data and privacy situations. So um, 491 just says that if there is a law or something, a requirement that is less specific or less restrictive than FERPA or our state student privacy laws, then you have to follow the more restrictive of the two laws. So that's kind of just what everyone does anyway and should be doing anyway, but just putting that out there clearly. Um, 98, SB 98 um, requires USBE and LEAs to report additional information to the Utah Cyber Center if there is a breach that occurs. So it outlines in that bill, you can go in there and see, and it'll be in the bill book, exactly what data points need to be shared if there is a breach with any of your data or your information. Um, and then 231, um, that if there's biometric surveillance going on within your LEA, there needs to be a written policy at the LEA level that um, explains why, um, how that is collected, and what is done with that information. So if you're going to collect biometric data, make sure you have a policy in place that talks about that. So that's those three. Um, the other two we wanted to hit on was the Social Media Regulation Act amendments um, and the school closure amendments. These are just, again, to put on your radar just in case. Um, for 464, it just says that a Utah minor account holder or a Utah minor account holder's parent can bring a cause of action against a social media company. This is when you're kind of seeing a few different states take up, but that... Um, that they would have standing. So that student or that student's parents would have standing to sue the social media company if anything bad or adverse, adverse tended to happen. Um, 341, um, if any of you are in the Alpine School District or have been part of the Canyons Jordan School District conversations, um, there's lots of school closures that cause a lot of consternation um, among communities. And so 348 was trying to lay out what is a um, solution to that, that that kind of sees all sides. And so 341 just lays out the procedure that an LEA should follow if they're planning on closing any schools or thinking about closing any schools. So yeah. that may impact a little bit of what you do as well. Sharing, um, obviously, this Chris and Campbell's um, side of the... Uh the wheelhouse, but yeah, just make sure that you guys are aware likewise, because we have to have our, our data updated by certain times and it changes what has been done in the past. For the most part, you know, we are aware of what schools are going to be opening um, and closing, but we just need to have that information more so, um, more so on what's now put in those policies, less on, hey, this is when cactus is rolling over. So just be aware of that. Okay. Um, and I, we will have these three documents for your use and your reference. They are not quite finished yet. We are still working on them, but there'll be a public education summary, a quick guide, and then all the budget sheets. If you are interested in any of that, those should be coming down to the LEA. It's probably, um, if not the end of next week, the week following. Um, so within the month for sure. So be on the lookout for those. And then if you have any questions, um, Aaron clearly knows all that you need to know, but if you have any legal questions or about other bills that were not mentioned today, I'm happy to help out my emails there. And then Angie Stallings is our deputy superintendent of policy and Sydney Dixon is our fearless leader, um, superintendent of schools. So you are more than free to reach out to any of us. Thank you. At least, thank you for joining us in this meeting. Um, just sharing that with with the whole group. Uh, what a, it was a there's so much that happened in this legislative session. There's a lot of people who are involved with it. Um, from and so a big thank you to all of you who were involved helping uh, your school your school your LEA leadership um, in discussions, making sure information is communicated back and forth. Yes, there's there's a there's a hefty lift after after this year. So again, thank you for all you guys do. Um, headaches, challenges, uh, no one can retire because <laughs> there's too much work to be done. Anyway, with that said, thank you. Thanks, Elise. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, Tammy, it's yours.
Hi, I'm Tammy Walker. Um, I was just going to give an announcement for the summer EBT program for 2024 and 2025. Next slide, please. The Consolidated Appropriations Act of 23 authorized a permanent nationwide summer electronic benefit transfer program beginning in 2024. And that we call that program Summer EBT. And basically what it does is it provides a benefit for students that are eligible for free or reduced meals. And it gives them the benefit so that they can use money over the summer to purchase meals. Um, the required state funding match for summer 2024 operations was not approved in the state budget. So we will not be participating for summer 24. However, the state funding was approved for summer 2025. The Department of Workforce Services, DWS, and CNP will continue discussions and program plans to get it in place for summer 25. CNP is also working with dating statistics to automate much of the process using either UTREX or USIMS, USIMS, and we will notify LEAs as soon as we can of any changes that you will need to be making, any additional fields you might need to be providing. Next slide, please. Um, these are just a, a couple of notes on eligibility for child nutrition. A lot of your food service directors will have this information, but just wanted to kind of give you an update in case you need to update anything in your systems. The School year 25 income eligibility guidelines were released by USDA, and there's a link for a corrected chart that should be used by your food service director and in your online systems. And that chart provides information that the, um, the income eligibility uh, numbers that can be used to determine free reduced eligibility for the next school year. Another thing to keep in mind is the USBE board requested that it, in order for us to participate in summer EBT, we have to allow the households to give their consent for us to share student information with DWS. And so we, our office is going to be providing an updated free re reduced price bill application template. This will be sent out to your food service directors and this will be um, an email or consent form that will be sent out to the parents and will allow them to say yes or no. We can provide our their information to DWS to participate in the summer EBT program. And then our office is also uh, revising a declaration of income form for the school year 25 for school year 25 and, and that will have the new and updated income eligibility guideline information we post that on the nslp central page in canvas next slide please and then just a quick reminder for community elig eligibility provision or cep any schools that want to apply and want to participate in CEP for the next school year, 25, will need to be running direct certification by April 1st. The April 1st student enrollment and direct certification documentation is what is used to determine if CEP, if sites can participate in CEP beginning next year. And that's everything that I had. Did anyone have any questions? Yes, well, not in question. I'm gonna add in some information. So what does all this mean? Well, we've got a year. <laughs> um, just sharing with the group, we have had a number of discussions going back to uh, Tammy. What would be the date or the month that you would expect to do a data poll from everyone to get this um, all this information? It's it's changed a little bit. Um, so we the program requirements are that we send it we issue the benefits to students no later than seven days before the end of school and no more than 14 days 
before the end of school. So we have basically the two week period before school ends. And as a state, we decide the date that school ends. That will be a statewide date that we tell you F and S, this is our school end date. And we will have to be issuing benefits by two weeks um, prior to that, or beginning two weeks prior to that date. So we will probably, you know, that's probably mid to end of May. That means if we're pulling data from Utrex, USBE, it's, it's, uh, um, I, we're going to try to do it as, as late as possible because any students that become free reduced eligible after we pull from Utrex will have to be provided um, by Excel spreadsheet documents well, individually. I'm going to restate that as we don't know. How, I would say end of April, maybe beginning of May. Okay, so another just heads up. This is, we don't think we're going to do a data submission, like adding a, another data submission in our schedule, because we already have the October 1, the December 1, and the end of year. But this is definitely before the end of year, where we have to collect this data. Um, but we need to have some level of certainty that the information that we pull inside of Utrex on a certain date or a time frame will be accurate. Uh, we will be working with CNP and with QIF and team and with the USIMS team to determine um, how this is going to work. Um, you will need to be making sure that uh, the information that uh, CNP is providing you is collected and stored within the database and that there is a way that it will be sent. Um, again, we'll just say right now via Utrex so, that, so the information can be pulled. And so... For example, I envision that we we come up with a day, we we notify everyone, say, okay, on this date, we're actually going to do a poll. Something like that. We'll make sure everyone has your data submission inside of there, um, or you have data that's you know as reliable as possible. I don't know if we need to go to uh, a, a, a certified process like we do on the October, December, and end of year or not. Again, just sharing with the group, these discussions are in process, slightly fluid. If you have concerns, please um, bring them to our April meeting so we can discuss in more detail. Thank you. I, I will say that um, when we were planning on participating this summer, DWS was planning on us pulling the data as of May 1st. So that might be the date that they're looking for as the cutoff when we when we get our data pulled from Utrex. So possibly. Thank you. Just just more for you guys to, to digest and think about. Life's changing. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um I will be um, talking about the school of record field that is reported in Utrex. Um, and this is meant to just be a review. This is um, not anything new. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we have received um, questions from LEAs. So we just wanted to do a review of this field that again, is already being collected in Utrex. Um, the School of Record field is submitted on the student or S1 record um, as part of your daily Utrex submissions. Um, it is optional, meaning that it can be left blank. But what that means is that if it's left blank, um, it's treated as yes. Um, and then if you submit a value of N, then that means um, on that record, it is not a school of record. So it can either be blank or no N. Um, you can find those codes as well as um, various notes, which are really helpful on this field in the Utrecht specifications, which I will show on the next slide, but that is page 47 for your reference. Um, so if you wanna go to the next slide, 
Um, so this is exactly what is in the Utrecht specifications for the School of Record field. Um, again, it is on the student record and an N if you submit that means that it is not a school of record. For the student, if you leave it blank, then that implies that it is a school of record. Um, the notes are really important, which I'll talk about on some of the other slides, but um, I'll just go ahead and go, I won't read through them here. I'll go over my next slides and then if anyone wants to reference those notes, they are in the Utrecht specifications. All right, next slide. Um, so a common question that we get um, about what the School of Record field means or is, um, so while it is used as one of several tiebreakers for determining uh, which school will be counted with a student in various rates and reports. Um, it is not a designation of a student's primary school or LEA. Um, so we just want to make that clear because its name, I think, implies to people that, that that's what it means. Um, and so that is, again, in one of the notes um, that we just looked at from the specs. Um, it is possible for a student to have multiple enrollment records during a school year that have school of record blank reported, um, which again means that it is a school of record. Um, however, along with that, if LEAs are submitting multiple active S1 records, meaning that um, a record is not exited, um, with school of record blank, then you will get a warning. Um, and that comes directly again from one of the notes um, in the specifications that we just looked at. Um, any questions on that so far? Okay. Um, so how this affects funding, um, schools that are reported as school of record know, um, again, you have to submit that N on the student record, um, they will not receive membership for the student. Um, membership is not included on any reports or in any totals that we report to finance. Um, and that comes directly from one of those notes in the specifications. So that's really important um, because again, any school of record no um, enrollment is not going to receive funding. Um, school of record blank is a business rule to be included in the October 1, December 1 and year in counts. Um, so the to be in the official count, you um, cannot be a school of record no um, on that student record. Um, finally, schools providing classes to students in the SOEP program, that's a separate um, form of funding. And so one of their business rules is that they must be marked as school of record no. Um, and again, that comes from one of the notes and the specifications, um, they do receive funding in a different way. And so that's why we don't include those records in our official counts. All right, next slide. Um, the other- there's, thing there is still oh. question in the chat. Yes. Okay, if a student is enrolled for only one as so we've been taking a full schedule. Um, so I might want to look at that separately, um, to get more details on that before answering that particular question, unless anyone else on here from USB wants to jump in on that. Um, but that specific question, I would probably want to look at the student's enrollment record and to, to for sure answer that. <laughs> Unless Kristen has an answer or Aaron.
Okay. Um, so we will get you an answer officially for that, but I might want a little bit more information. Um, okay. um, can we get clarification on this? Are the, the people who are um, making these comments, are, are you LEAs that provide both SOEP courses and regular courses? Because it's just the SOEP provider that this will smart school of record now. So there you might you might have a situation then if you're an LEA that does that where you have if you have a school that's an SOEP provider and then you have the rest of your LEAs, you know, normal schools. Um, you prob you probably have to enroll the student under two different enrollments. One enrollment record for the SOEP school and the SOEP course, and that enrollment gets the school of record no, and then one enrollment for the rest of the courses and enrollment that the student is taking, and that enrollment um, is, you leave school of record blank, the school of record blank is the one that's going to get the funding, and then the SOEP funding is done differently. Yeah, so it sounds like Sarah, um, Utah Virtue Academy is doing it that way. So the other two LEs that made these comments, um, maybe, maybe if you're still, if my answer didn't make sense to you, maybe um, you could get with Sarah and find out more about that. If you're not providing the SOEP course, you just have a student who's taking the SOEP course through a different LEA, you are not the SOEP provider. You do not mark, have to mark school of record no. It's the SOEP provider who marks school of record no. And only for the courses that are SOEP courses. Okay, I see thumbs up. So I think I got, I think I, I, think I got it. Okay, cool. Okay, thank you, Malia. Thanks, yeah. Trisha. Okay, um, so how this affects grad rates, which is the other big um, question that we get a lot. Um, so enrollment records that are reported with school of record N or no are not included in the federal four-year cohort graduation rate calculation. Um, so those records are excluded. Um, what this means is that if a student transfers out of your LEA, and they enroll in another school that reports the student at their school as school of record no, the student will still be counted to your LEA for graduation um, if you were the last school of record enrollment. Um, so an example of that might be, you know, a student tells you that they're transferring somewhere else and you mark them with the TR code or another transfer code. Um, and then they show up on your, your dropout report and you're wondering why, because you know you can see an enrollment at another school in Utrex. Um, well, most of the time that occurs because that enrollment is marked as school of record no. And so for graduation, that, um, does not count, and so they are counted to you with the last school of record enrollment. Um, we see this most commonly um, with SOAP enrollments. Again, that's the provider that marks them as no. Um, and then for some alternative or YIC type facilities, um, and then some schools that provide adult ed. Um, those are the most common scenarios that we see. And we know that that, um, you know, we get complaints about that. And understandably, I, I can understand why that um, doesn't seem fair in all cases. Um, so we will continue to look at that um, as we try and figure out like what um, we have to do for graduation with federal rules. Um, 
but as it stands right now, um, those enrollments that are marked as school of record now are not counted for graduation. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So what that means is that it's really important for your LEA um, to make sure that you're coding things correctly because it can really affect um, the outcome that is counted to you. Um, so sometimes there's nothing you can do about um, the way another school reports a student as school of record no and the way that affects your grad rate. Um, but there are some cases where it, it can be affected and you can do something about it. Um, as always, um, with any student and with any um, enrollment record that's being exited, you always want to make sure to use the most correct exit code, meaning um, the way that the student left um, should be coded as accurately as possible. Um, and sometimes that can make a difference whether the student will count as a dropout to your LEA, even if they exited to another school that reports them as school of record no. Um, so an example of that is if a student exits to an adult ed school, but maybe you didn't know what type of school it was, they just told you they were transferring. And so you marked them as a transfer. Um, and then when they enroll in that other school, they're marked as school of record now and they end up counting as a dropout to you. Um, what you could have done is found out more information about where they went. Hopefully if it was to go to adult ed, they filled out a form that exits them from the K-12 system. Um, and then you can use the AE exit code, um, which then triggers you to know, I need to check this before October to see, did the student complete? Did they take the GED or did they get a diploma in adult ed? Because even if they do that at that other school, you can then update them on your record. Um, and so rather than counting as a dropout, um, then they could be counted as an other completer. Um, so there are some scenarios where that um, can make a difference, and I've seen it in different um, LEA's grad rates. So please reach out to me if you have questions on that. Um, and does anyone, let's see, in the chat it says, curious about students who come to live in hospital or other medical facilities. Um, so the exit codes that we have, there's a few different codes and it kind of, we would need a little more information on the exact situation, but some of the codes that could be used um, when a student um, leaves to be institutionalized, we do have the withdraw for medical reasons, um, which is an excluded code um, that does require documentation um, from the medical provider. So you would need that in order to use that code. Um, we also have the transfer to private code, which is also an excluded code um, and can be used in some of those situations. Um, so those are the most common codes to use, um, depending on what that student situation is. Also, it depends on if they're still receiving services, um, either through your LEA or at whatever um, institution they're at, that can make a difference which code to use as well. Uh, Often I get students who come from other LEAs who are housed in a hospital, but we provide, okay, so you're providing the services uh, when, while they're undergoing treatment. Okay, so this is a little different because they're enrolled or they're receiving services from you, so they're not exiting from your LEA. Um, so let's see. 
So what is the exact question, like how you would code them when they leave or whether they would be counted to you? And we can go back to that one if Keith wants to give a little more information. Um, okay, so Bonnie's question, if a student transfers out saying they're transferring to homeschool, will they count as a dropout? Um, so the answer is uh, no, if they're coded um, correctly. The transfer to homeschool code TH for uh, districts or for a charter um, CH, if those codes are used, then they are excluded. So those are not counted as a dropout. Um, yes, they do need a homeschool affidavit or documentation. Um, that's required in the districts. Um, and we encourage charters to get that from the district. Where that's not possible, there are other ways to document that, um, but it does, when a student goes to homeschool, whether they're in a charter or a district, it does require documentation and they are excluded. How do we submit these students? We get a lot of students that come from other LEAs who are at risk students. Okay, so you're asking more, how do you submit them like for enrollment? Um, yeah, why don't you email and we can talk about that um, outside of this meeting. But yeah, let's, uh, we will look at that and get you an answer. Okay, um, any more questions on like examples of coding with exit codes and how it affects school of record no enrollments? Um, my biggest suggestion would just be if you are reviewing your grad rate data and find that a student is counting to you because um, their next enrollment is marked as school of record no, um, my suggestion would be to do some research. I know it takes time, but find out where they went um, and what type of school it is. Um, because like I said, if there is a way to code them um, in a way that won't count as a dropout to you, then that is worth the time in uh, researching that. And you know whether that's through a phone call or an email or calling the other school, um, that can help your grad rate in some cases. And it's more accurate coding as well. All right, next slide. Okay, any more questions on school of record? Um, if you do, you can always email as well um, if you think of anything. Um, so my next um, announcement is just an update on some validation changes that we've been talking about for the past um, whole school year since October. Um, we knew last October that these validations were going to need to change. Um, and so this is just an update of what we've been telling you um, to let you know that some of this work is done and in production, so you should be seeing this. Um, so for the um, District of Residence validation um, S1.368, um, that is the validation that means it can't be left blank. Um, this previously only triggered for charters and now it is triggering for districts as well. Um, right now it is only a warning for districts um, and it will stay that way through the end of the year. Um, however, next year, um, so for the October submission, it will be a fatal error for districts. So the purpose in putting it into place now as a warning um, was to let districts have time to implement that change, but also to see, um, you know, if you're not entering that on a bunch of students, just know that that will be a lot of fatal errors come next school year. 
Um, and as was mentioned in the chat, I think by Bobby, um, we will try to have these particular changes where it turns to a fatal error done before September 1st, because we know um, the October deadline next year is gonna be tight. Um, so probably just better to try and get those warnings um, cleared by year end, even though technically they're not blocking students for districts. Um, it's better to get in the habit now of submitting those because you're gonna have to submit them by the fall. Um, the next one, S1.369, that validation is just if you are submitting the district of residence, it needs to be a valid value. We chose to just keep that as an error for everybody, even districts, because if you're submitting the value, um, it, it needs to be valid. So it's it just needs to be one of the district numbers. Um, but districts will not get that if you're not submitting the field at all. Okay, next slide. Um, and then for the level two changes related to district of residence, um, it is a warning um, right now. Um, the change was made so that it's triggering for everybody. In the past, it was only for charters. Um, now districts are included. Um, it will stay as a warning through the end of this school year for everybody. But by next school year, so again for October, um, that will become a fatal error. So that's really important to keep in mind for both districts and charter schools. Um, we are required to make this change. And again, we will work with Cliff's team to make sure that's done before September, that way you have plenty of time um, with the October submission. Um, and that that warning should already be in place. Um, the last one, um, it's related, but it's the invalid address level two warning. That one is still being worked on, so districts probably aren't seeing this one yet. Um, it's always been a warning for charters. Um, districts will be included. Um, I would expect that one will be in place in the next few weeks. It will stay as a warning through the end of this school year, but again, for everybody, it will go fatal next school year, meaning for October. Um, and again, we will try to have that in place by September 1st. That way it's not thrown at you um, last minute. Okay, next slide. Okay, so that's all I have. Are there any questions related to any of those district of residence, level one or level two validations? All right, I will turn the time to Cliff. All right, thank you. Uh, Quick note on that last part that was mentioned should be out within the few weeks. Um, I can just concur on that, that that is scheduled for uh, being completed within the next two weeks. So that will be expected to be in production for you for that address validation. Um, I'll be talking a little bit to just give a little bit of reminder about where we're at with the SSID merges. This is, uh, again, something that we all probably already know, but that we want to address these as soon as possible and that we get a little bit of a snowball effect uh, if we wait for getting those SSIDs fixed. That uh, what happens is that a second SSID is created after a first SSID is already in place, typically because they're not able to find the first one uh, for some reason. So the new SSID is created at some point when we're able to come back to that and find it and, ad and address the situation, uh, the procedure is to always go back to the first SSID. So it always will merge back to the original, uh, just to make sure everyone's clear on how that behavior goes. Uh, but it's possible that that second SSID may already have some things associated onto it. 
And the more things that get associated onto it, the longer it goes, uh, the more difficult it is to reliably say that everything will get aligned back to that student. Uh, we still do our best efforts to do so, uh, but uh, we're just kind of giving that reminder out for everyone to where we can work on that together and try to address those as quickly as possible to reduce the amount of extra work that's involved, depending on how long that's uh, not been addressed for. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, then we've got reviewing and resolving your validations daily. This has been a hot topic for today and one that will be continuing. Um, I did notice that when I said this year, uh, there'll be less time, uh, but that is referring mostly to this upcoming October. Uh, we're not planning on shortening the length of time for the end of school year, just to make sure that you're clear on that. Uh, and we do plan to give as much time as possible for the October time uh, for going out and uh, being able to use the finalizer tool. Uh, all year, you'll have the opportunity to get those daily collections and to be able to address those. And that's really the, the sediment to get from this conversation is that we really want to encourage that we're trying to take care of those as quickly as possible to where you're not trying to get to them all at the very end, uh, because all of the fatal errors uh, have to be resolved and there aren't really going to be any extensions available this year. Uh, we'll, we will be looking into that and discussing that plenty uh, in this next session that we have in April uh, and bringing forth anything that we can, you know, come up with from our side to help with that time. Uh, but just as, again, a reminder that some of those things which those fatal errors are affecting, uh, that you don't want to let them go unchecked. And that also affects this school year, too, and just all of the time. Uh, whenever there's a fatal error, what that means is that the student isn't getting, load, isn't getting loaded into the system. And if that student isn't getting loaded into the system, that means they're not going to be passed through to RISE or ACT or any other such assessments. Uh, they won't be getting out to student programs such as CMP, special education. And then the one that hits home for everyone, and that's that the school district and state funding is affected. Uh, when a student isn't actually resolved for their fatal errors. I'll go to the next screen. Uh, so again, this is a reminder example. Uh, some of you may have already seen this slide from uh, last year, but just bringing this out. Um, I'll try not to go into all the depth of this, but just to make sure you have this here as a come back to as a reminder, if there's any of you that have seen it for the first time, uh, then again, to start sharing this information as soon as possible uh, for things which will be helpful for clearing out your submissions. Uh, and again, the level two uh, fatal errors being the permanent exits, the student grade level inconsistencies, the dual scram, the dual kindergarten fail, and a quick note about these level two errors, and that's that even if you get rid of all of your errors um, on day one, uh, it doesn't mean that these level two errors can't possibly still show up because of another school. So this is another thing which we strongly recommend checking back on uh, come that first or second or even for here in uh, this next upcoming in July, that as we get close to that end date, you'll need to check to make sure that another school hasn't caused a conflict to where uh, this level two check that goes past your own LEA, but cross checks all LEAs together, uh, that it's possible that this may be a collaboration that's needed between two LEAs to resolve some of these errors. So uh, please keep that part in mind. The level one fatal errors, uh, obviously those are just for your LEA. And I believe that those that are working those are pretty familiar with it. But again, I've got some uh, details here for you to come back to. Go ahead to the next screen. 
Uh, also, as normal, there'll be the courtesy data review. And I just wanted to point out what some of those are. Uh, this is, again, an example from the October submission, is that's really what I'm trying to prep uh, people for, uh, even though we do have the end of year submission still coming up. And there is a, a little bit of variation uh, for that. So this isn't a perfect rendition for what you're going to have, but this is a good representation still. Uh, where there's district of residence errors, SSID warnings, total enrollment counts, count of foreign exchange students, economically uh, disadvantaged or free and reduced lunch indicators, early uh, learning counts, cohort graduation rates, cohort reassignment uh, for students on a path to an alternate diploma, and special ed event dropout data. So all of these are things which We'll be sharing that information with you to prep you on and goes above what's just on those fatal errors. So all these will still have to be resolved for that finalization. So uh, again, we get this information out to you uh, much earlier than uh, that period. So we'll be trying to collaborate with you this whole time to uh, come September 1st and on uh, to be able to try to watch for these and help you get them all resolved on time. Uh, go ahead to the next screen. Uh, and as a note, if there's anyone that is involved in this and isn't entirely familiar, uh, just uh, again, another copy over from previous messaging about the examine file. Uh, this is again, coming in for your Utrex overview and uh, where you can get that data to find out how things are going. What we received uh, comes through on that Excel spreadsheet uh, that you get for the examine file. You also have the additional files for your warnings or errors. Uh, and also, uh, again, a reference here for the S1X update uh, for where to go into go after that and to get that fixed. Uh, go ahead to the next screen. Uh, this is an area that I don't know if uh, everyone is utilizing, uh, and I'd uh, welcome any feedback on this. But on the Utrex overview, uh, you've got a link there for view data uh, with the little two forward arrows. What that's going to do is that's going to open you up into seeing uh, a little bit deeper not necessarily the Excel, uh, but it is a similar view to the Excel, but a live page, where first you're gonna see your district with the counts that come through. And uh, these counts aren't uh, per record level. Uh, so there is a note there that we always put up that these counts are raw counts and will not exactly match the filtered counts seen on the reports. Uh, but these counts that you see here are distinct uh, counts where it takes out some of the duplications. Um, if each one of those will open up. So if you clicked on that 481, it would open you up into being able to see pages of that chosen by how many records you want to see there. I've got that showing as the 100. And in this instance, you can see that this student has two records that came through and that's why there's a discrepancy there between the 481 and the 482 that it counted. That 482 is also going to be the same number you would see on your examine file. So when you're checking your records and wanting to see uh, if things loaded all the way through, this is another tool that you can see that with. And again, this is covering each of these objects, the students, the scram students, youth in custody, uh, youth in care, uh, course, sections, incidents, and your transcripts. Uh, there's also that search feature right there to be able to search for the SSID. Um, do note, though, it has like the uh, extra few leading zeros on there if you're using this tool. Uh, but this is hopefully something that might be able to help you uh, feel a little bit more confident about uh, who was loaded or to be able to jump in and check if you do have fatal errors, um, you won't see them come through on this page. Uh, those fatal error students, uh, you'll be able to see that 
they didn't load to Utrex by cross-checking with this page and seeing that they're not on this page, but they were on your examined file. Uh, and they'd also be on your uh, fatal errors page as well, too. Uh, so hopefully that's helpful. I'll go ahead to the next screen. Uh, a new thing which is coming out, which again, as I've mentioned, we're not going to be creating any uh, non-loading fatal errors for is uh, WIDA Screener. This is something that's been asked for by LEAs uh, for LEAs and something also to help our students to just make sure they're not taking more screeners than they need to or wasting uh, LEA's time uh, giving the screener more than once. Go to the next screen. Uh, I kind of covered a little bit of that here uh, for its purpose, uh, but the flow on this is that this is going to change a little bit, that students that have taken the home language survey uh, and would be appropriate to take the screener, uh, we would be having LEAs uh, go out and actually check to see if that screener has already been provided uh, and doing so by logging into the data gateway and uh, searching for that student. And that would be available for you to see where, when, and the score that they received. Uh, the primary consumers of this, like I said, uh, this is really for LEAs and the school staff uh, to be able to support the students and also uh, make their own time efficient as well. So there's going to be a lot of uh, reliance of adoption from uh, the LEAs and school staff to both support this and to use this uh, to be able to help make uh, this an effective tool. Uh, what this should be doing, again, is reducing that burden uh, to where you're not having to give those screeners multiple times um, and having that available that available data to you without having to wait for, say, a QM file to be mailed to you or something else that uh, may cause you to say, well, let's just screen them because we don't know, but we want to get an answer about the screening as quickly as possible. So this is going to help alleviate those situations and make that data available for you. Just saw uh, a note there that this needs to be added to our SIS system if it's not already there. And that is a yes. Um, I'm about to jump on that. Uh, next screen, please. So the fields to be collected, which um, at this point, my understanding is that each of the SISs are already working with this uh, in conjunction with each of the LEAs as it's not a new requirement that the screeners are being given, uh, that's always been there. Uh, and LEAs have always been getting that information and they've always been putting it into the QM files. Uh, so that expectation is, is not changing or getting adjusted with this. This is simply uh, the state trying to help move that data along from one LEA to another LEA as fast and efficient as possible uh, without again having to wait for you to, say, mail that QM file off uh, to the other LEA that they possibly moved to. Uh, so we would need to get the WIDA screener proficiency score and then the WIDA screener proficiency date, and that's it. Uh, we're not looking to get a ton of information. Uh, we're not looking for each breakdown of their uh, proficiency on the screener, just that total number for the overall proficiency score, and then the date that that was given. Uh, and with that, we can infer the rest of the information that we'll be putting out onto the data gateway uh, for you to be able to reference to uh, know, for instance, like where it was taken, like what LEA provided the screener. Uh, that'll come along with the fact that we're collecting this and we know what LEA sent it to us. Uh, so um, I think that the rest of this I've already covered here. Uh, so let's go ahead to the next screen and uh, we'll give you an example of what we're currently viewing the mock-up for this data gateway page to be. 
Uh, this should already look pretty familiar for any of you who are looking at assessments already, because we're going to put it on that same assessment page for on the student find that uh, we're just going to be adding in. Uh, WIDA is already showing, so that part's already there. The red box here, that's what's going to be added in place initially is the WIDA screener scores. And uh, again, the, the detail of this mock-up is uh, still available to be changed, uh, but this is what we're currently projecting that we're going to be able to show on this, and we're open to any feedback to where how we can better serve you with uh, getting this information to you. And if there's anything that we've missed uh, that you would uh, feel that would be needed for you to properly handle this, uh, this is kind of the one of the last calls before uh, this starts to move into action. And we start to uh, get this put into place and sharing that information out. And again, if this isn't available for your SIS to be able to provide by October 1st, uh, and there's not a fear that this is gonna prevent any students from loading or prevent you from finalizing. So as this is developed and released, it's uh, it's going to be for the student's benefit, but not at the student's risk. Uh, any questions on any of these three items that I've just gone over? Uh, possibly should have uh, taken a break in the middle. But if there's anything that anyone has that you'd like to re-go over or make any suggestions or give any feedback on, Uh, so again, we're still at that early state. So uh, with defining how the SIF is going to send them, uh, possibly you're referring to like the exact like SIF names and things like that. Uh, I'm going to say that at this point, uh, it's still a little bit early. We wanted to get this into your hands and uh, get some feedback again as fast as possible. Uh, I expect that we should be able to have the SIF definitions in place probably within the next month to where we can have that exact data for you to where you can reference and say, when I talked about the two fields, what the specific names are, uh, how you would call that, and what sort of uh, organization that would fit into uh, under you know what object that you're sending with SIF. Uh, all those details are, are pending, but we're happy to get them to you as soon as possible. Any other questions or concerns? Or any feedback? If there's anyone that feels that um, their SIS isn't always doing this, uh, isn't already uh, taking these and recording those, you know, we'd also be interested in knowing um, what kind of burden is going to be out there for the SISs that maybe we haven't uh, gotten feedback from yet. Uh, and our time to implement this, uh, to make this available uh, for you, you know, outside of your SIS's time, uh, we're looking for doing a pretty quick turnaround on this. So that would mean that we're hoping for having this in place for the start of the next year. So this should be in place and available and anyone who is able to have their SIS set up and provide this information over to us uh, we'll be collecting it and sharing it. So uh, we shouldn't have a long turnaround on our time, but we're also not forcing any deadline dates on this. Uh, any other questions? All right. Well, I think that uh, that covers everything I have. And I think that I'm the last one in, so I'll hand yeah, back off to Cluster. Um, Aaron had to drop off. Um, I just yeah, wanted to just go wanted back to, to the last slide, if you don't mind, Nicole, or sorry, the first slide, if you don't mind. Um, so just before people drop off, um, 
the next meeting again is in April and it is our spring data conference. Um, and so we just wanted to put the um, flyer back up for you if possible. If not, we'll send it out in the email, but the April meeting will be the spring data conference and there is an in-person option. So for those that are able to um, be there in person and want to be in person, um, you have that option. And then we will still offer it online on Zoom the way we do all of our meetings. Um, so just as a note, if you um, need to make any kind of arrangements, it will be an all day morning to afternoon meeting, um, similar to the last few years where there'll be a few different sessions and then a lunch break. Um, but that will be our meeting for next month. So we'll send this flyer out as well. Um, and as for today, I think we're done. So thank you.